All right, so we got quite a few requests for an ECG video, and I was really trying my hardest to get it up as soon as possible because I, I know even some of you had tests that were coming up soon, so you wanted to have something to review. Um, so, so last night I was kind of racking my brain a little bit of, about how to make a really simple ECG video because there are a lot of ECG videos out there that you can find on um, YouTube and different things like that. Um, but I think that really always keep it as simple as possible without losing important information and being able to take that information and apply it to something that's more advanced. Now, ECGs really go from something that's very basic to something that's very advanced. Hence why we have ACLS courses. Um, for any nursing students or nurses that haven't taken an ACLS class, I would certainly recommend doing an ACLS class. Um, I would think it would be a better idea that you do an ACLS class after you've done some kind of basic ECG course, whether it's in class, um, whether you've done BLS, that way it's really gonna, gonna help you transition from you know pretty fundamental ECG stuff to more advanced ECG things. So I think the easiest way to do this video overall is to really focus on some of the basic concepts and to focus on the most common heart rhythm disorders. And by common, I guess what I'm really trying to say is the popular ones. Popular in the sense that if you were going to have a test tomorrow, what are the rhythms that you're more than likely going to need to know in order to take that test? So that's what I wanna focus on. And just making sure that you have an example um, and a solid understanding of just looking at an ECG strip and what it means. And that way it's gonna make more sense to you when you start to look at more and more of them. So to start off with, I just have this picture here of an ECG tracing. Now we know that all these waves and these dips, they represent something. An ECG tracing essentially is just a snapshot of the activity that's happening in the heart. Each one of these waves and these dips represents a piece of the heart. So first thing I think we all do is I'll draw our heart. And this is more like a Valentine's heart, but just so we have an idea, right? And I'm gonna draw our chambers. So we know that our top chambers are our atrium and our bottom chambers are our ventricles, okay? So really this ECG tracing is telling us what part of the heart is doing what and how it's doing it. So here's uh, my example of that. So here, I'm gonna start writing the letters that correspond with each one of these dips and these waves. So if we're looking at an ECG tracing, these are all the identifiable parts that we should see. We should have a P wave, a Q, R, S. We should have a T wave, and sometimes, I'll put a little asterisk, sometimes you might see a U wave. Now, a U wave is really unknown, meaning that we don't know what it represents normally. However, we have recognized that when you see a U wave present, if it's a prominent U wave, if it's elevated or depressed, that can really indicate that there's a serious cardiac issue that's happening um, you know, in this, in this individual. So, our P wave, belongs to our atria. So I'm gonna put the P's in there. Our QRS, which is known as a QRS complex because it's really this entire kind of pyramid, this entire waveform here belongs to our ventricles. So I'm gonna write QRS here. And our T wave belongs to our ventricles as well. And for, for this, we're gonna leave the U wave out because it's really, I don't wanna say it's not something you shouldn't focus on, but it's really not the majority of what you're gonna be looking at, okay? So let's talk about these a little bit more in depth. So we're gonna come over here and let's write our P wave. Let's write our QRS complex. And let's write our T wave. And then we can talk about what they mean. Now, if you're even looking at this um, ECG pattern, I'll, I'll always point this out. If you notice, the P wave, the T wave, the sometimes U wave, 
they all look pretty consistent, right, as far as shape and size goes. But this QRS complex is really big. It's, it's the one that stands out the most in ECG tracing. And if you think about it, it makes sense. If the QRS complex represents ventricle activity, well, we know the ventricles are larger and we know that they squeeze harder. So it makes sense that on a pattern that it's gonna be a little bit more dominant than the P wave is. Okay, so the P wave we know belongs to the atria, right? It represents atrial contraction. And the term that you're gonna see for this is depolarization. Depolarization means contraction. I always like to write the squeeze. So this is what the P wave represents. The QRS complex, which is here, right? This whole section here, represents ventricle contraction. Or, like I said, our fancy term, depolarization, which is the same as the squeeze, okay? And then our T wave, which we have here, is going to represent our ventricles again. Remember, we put it in our ventricle spot so we can see that. It represents ventricle relaxation. So when our ventricles relax, we know they're really filling, right? The opposite of depolarization is re polarization. So this means the relaxing or the filling. So if you've seen these terms, and I'm sure you have, you've seen the terms depolarization, repolarization. Remember that depolarization means to squeeze, right? Repolarization means to relax. And I guess an easy way to remember that is that there's an R in repolarization and there's an R in relax. So that's how you'll know the difference. Depolarization is contraction, repolarization is relaxation. All right, so that is then our basics. So now we know that P belongs to the atrium, that is gonna represent atrial activity. QRS belongs to our ventricles. T belongs to our ventricles as well. One is going to represent the squeeze and one is going to represent the relax, all right? Now, one thing that I used to ask when I would go over ECGs, and even when I learned it as a student, is how come you can see the ventricles relax, but you never see the atria relax? Do they not relax? No, they do. They do relax. The issue is that you don't see it so nicely on an ECG tracing because this QRS complex is so large, it kind of overtakes what you would see on the wave, okay? So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna come down here and I'm gonna separate this so we can talk a little bit more about the electrical conduction of the heart. And we'll talk about those popular heart rhythms that I wanna go over. So I'm gonna draw the heart again. And of course, like I say in every video by now, I'm not a Picasso. So bear with my funny drawings. As a matter of fact, I need to make this atria a bit bigger. Okay. so. I'm gonna draw a heart here, and what I'm going to do is now we're gonna focus on the electrical conduction in the heart and see what we remember about that. So first thing, I'm gonna start drawing our nodes. And as I'm drawing them, think to yourself, do I remember what these nodes are? What these branches are? What is she drawing? Okay, and I'm gonna come here, and let me do one of these. Okay, good. All right. Now, what is this? What I've drawn here are our nodes. So essentially, if we're looking at this point here, we have an SA node, we have an AV node, we have a bundle of Hiss, and I'm just gonna write Hiss there. And down here, these, these two branches that you see here are fibers, are Purkinje fibers. So I'm gonna write them there, Purkinje fibers. Now, this heart is going to represent the electrical conduction. Now the conduction is what's going to actually cause activity in our heart. It's gonna cause a squeeze and it's going to cause the relaxation. So let's talk about these nodes because these are kind of our, our bosses in a sense. This is what's going to send out the electrical impulses for the heart to beat. So we have our SA node and we have our AV node. Our SA node sets a rate of about 60 to 100 
beats per minute. And our AV node sets a rate of about 40 to 60 beats per minute. This is really important to keep in mind and to remember, okay? So let's talk a little bit about some conduction issues. This is when we're gonna get into the, the heart rate patterns that I want you to recognize because these are our popular ones or the more common ones and certainly the ones that are gonna come up very often in testing. So the first thing, if we're gonna focus on our disorders of our atriums, right? So atrial issues. So I'm gonna write atrium here. The common atrial disorders or issues that we're gonna see will be AFib, a flutter and our SBT. Now, AFib, the A's stand for atrium, right? Or atrial. So this means atrial fibrillation. Fibrillation essentially means to quiver, right? Quiver, meaning that it's not really squeezing. There's no good contraction that's happening. It's really just a shake, if you will, like a really dull shake. So atrial fibrillation occurs when the SA node, this guy here, is rapidly firing. Rapid, rapid, rapid. So we're having a rapid firing here of the SA node, and it's just circulating around in the atrium. As a result, the atriums don't ever contract. They don't squeeze like they should. They just quiver. They're just shaking here inside the atrium. Well, a shaking atria is not a squeezing atria, and that can be a problem. Why is that a problem? If your atriums don't contract, they don't squeeze, then they're not fully emptying the blood into the ventricles, right? If they're not fully emptying the blood into the ventricles, that means that some of the blood is staying stagnant in the atria. And so instead of having a nice empty atria, you're gonna end up with an atria that has some blood left in it. Now we know that if you leave blood sitting in anything, think about leaving blood sitting in a container, it's going to clot eventually. And it's gonna clot specifically in this atria fibrillation because it's not being squeezed out properly. It's just quivering. Now if we end up with a blood clot in the atria, right? So if we end up with a blood clot, so here's just a representation of, let's say we've got some blood clots floating around in there. And one of these clots become dislodged and make its way down to the ventricles Remember where the ventricles pump out to, right? Our ventricles, depending on what side, is going to go to our lungs or it's going to go to our body, anywhere in our body. If we throw a clot to our lungs, we could end up with a pulmonary embolism. If we throw a clot anywhere to our body, we could end up with an obstruction. Imagine if that clot ended up in a vessel in our brain. Now we're looking at a stroke, right? So an atrial fibrillation can be a very dangerous rhythm. Now, if you're looking at a rhythm strip, and I'm gonna do my best to draw it as proper as possible so you can recognize it moving forward. If you're looking at a rhythm strip, an atrial fibrillation kind of looks like a little bit of this with your normal QRS, a little bit of this with your normal QRS, and a little bit of this with your normal QRS. What you see here is that you can clearly see the QRS complex, right? It's still there. But that P wave, you can't identify the P wave. It kind of looks like this flattened, chaotic quiver, if you will, and that's essentially what's happening in atrial fibrillation. Now, atrial fibrillation is a very, very fast rate. Atrial fibrillation is anywhere between 300 to 650 beats per minute. That's very, very fast. And again, we know that our biggest concern is that that blood is not really emptying. These are the patients that end up on blood thinners, as an example. They'll be on prophylactic blood thinner medication, anticoagulant therapy, to prevent any blood clots from developing so that they don't have the risk of throwing a clot and ending up in a really serious medical situation. Now, atrial flutter, which is our next thing here, atrial flutter is also an important rhythm to recognize and to understand. It's another one of our common ones. Atrial flutter is very similar to atrial fibrillation. It's that same chaotic firing that's happening in uh, the atria via the SA node, but instead of this 300 to 650 beats per minute, we actually end up with one that's a little bit less, still high, but a bit less, 
which would be about 250 to 350 beats per minute. Now the difference when you're looking at it on a rhythm strip, instead of this kind of flattened, wobbly, what should be P waves, you end up with something called sawtooth. So if you look how I'm drawing it, you see that those P waves they're called sawtooth for a reason because they look like the teeth that you would see on a saw. Very jagged lines. That QRS is still present that you see there. Um, but that P wave you see, it looks more like saw teeth. And I'm gonna go ahead and write the rate here so we have it. So 250 to 350 beats per minute. So that's the difference, slightly less. Now, coming down to our SVT, SVT stands for supraventricular tachycardia. And SVT is essentially a very fast rhythm that's happening. It's being originated by the SA node. SVT can be something that is brought on suddenly. Sometimes people, we see it um, occur in our clients that exercise, it can be exercise induced. And it's another one of these rapid firing scenarios that we have that's happening in the heart. In SVT, it looks really similar to uh, ventricular tachycardia. So where you kind of have that normal rhythm, but it's a little bit fast. And so here's my very bad drawing of it. Um, essentially, it looks like a super, uh, excuse me, it looks like a ventricular tachycardia. So you can slightly identify all those normal waves, but it's a very, very fast rhythm. Now SVT um, can be, I wouldn't say, let's see, 100 to 300 beats per minute. Um, SVT can actually be reversed or stopped or you know throw the heart back into rather regular rhythm by doing vasovagal maneuvers. So somebody that comes into SVT, before we like to do any kind of medicinal therapies, depending on if they're symptomatic or not, is have them do some vasovagal maneuver. So we might have them bear down, like they're trying to have a bowel movement, right? So that they bear down. We might apply some ice packs to the neck. Um, we might try to have them blow through a straw. So doing vasovagal maneuvers can help actually um, trigger the SA node to kick back into a normal cycle. If not, then we have to move on to medicinal therapies, okay? So those are our common ones of our atrium. I'm gonna to try to put a better picture of an SVT on uh, this video so you can see my, my drawing is not so good. <laughs> AFib and A-flutter is good. Okay, so if we're moving down, so this is our SA node, right? So moving down, now let's look at issues with our AV node. So I'm gonna come over here so we have some space and I'm gonna put our AV node, okay. So with our AV node, what I want you to remember is B, 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 and not Better Business Bureau. This is our bundle branch blocks. So we can have a first degree, a second degree, or a third degree bundle branch block. And essentially, in a bundle branch block, we know it's an issue at the AV node. There's going to be a conduction issue between this AV node and the bundle of Hiss. And it can also then translate to an issue of the conduction being sent down to these Purkinje fibers, which are gonna target our ventricles. A bundle branch block is essentially just that. And depending on the degrees, depends on the severity. So we can have a partial bundle branch block, right, which would be our first and second degrees, which means that there's going to be a slowed rate between the AV node to the bundle of Hiss. The rate's gonna be slowed because there's some kind of blockage. Same thing with our second degree. Now our third degree is going to be the worst of them all because that means that we have a total block. And the issue becomes this. If there's not any communication between the AV node and the bundle of Hiss, that means that the ventricles aren't getting the electrical communication, right? Because there's no kind of communication here. We have ourselves a block somewhere. We have ourselves a slowing at some point in these areas. That means the ventricles are going to suffer. If the electrical communication doesn't get to the right spot, it can be shot anywhere in the muscle of the heart and that's a problem. Obviously a third degree, we're looking at a total block. 
So we're not gonna get too deep into the bundle branch block, but I want you to recognize what it is, um, kind of how you would identify on a strip and what it, what it really means, okay? Now, if we move down to our ventricle, and let's make a ventricle spot here, right? So disorders at the ventricles, so we did atrium, we did AV and ventricles, we can have a V-fib and our VTAC. These, our, these are our common ventricle uh, conduction or heart rate disorder. So just in the sense that AFib is a quivering of the atria, V-fib is a quivering of the ventricles, okay? Now, we saw that in AFib, you kind of have that wacky rhythm with the P wave, you can't really identify it. It's essentially the same idea in looking at a rhythm strip, but instead of it being the P wave, because that's atria, right? P wave is atria, it's gonna be with the QRS because that is the contraction of the ventricle. So you're going to have kind of this erratic QRS, it's gonna be high because we know it's big, you know, all over the place. And that's gonna represent a ventricular fibrillation. Now the ventricular fibrillation is a deadly rhythm. I'm going to circle that in red. It's a deadly rhythm and a shockable rhythm. Think about again, quivering and fibrillation. If our ventricles are quivering, right? Remember the same idea. That means that we're not having emptying, full emptying I should say, of the blood in our ventricles. As a result, that means that we're not sending blood out of the ventricles like it should be. So what's gonna suffer? Our lungs are going to suffer and our body is going to suffer because we're going to have a decreased amount of blood going to our lungs to get oxygen because it's just sitting here quivering away and we're gonna have a decreased amount of blood getting out to our body because it's just sitting here quivering away. That can be deadly. That can be deadly. Essentially, we could suffocate because we're not getting enough blood into the lungs. And our body can suffer because we're not getting the right amount of perfusion. Now, in a ventricular tachycardia, this is just an abnormally fast rate. So what happens is that the ventricles are contracting too quickly with no regards to what's happening in the atria. So this is gonna look more like a regular ECG tracing, but it's going to be very, very rapid, and you're going to see higher peaks and more, more pronounced, more defined peaks in that Q wave. So this is my Q wave. If I was making them nice and even and normal, it would look kind of like on an even scale, but more defined and it's going to represent that um, really fast contraction without any regards to what's happening with the P wave. Um, and what I'm gonna do, because I can kind of see my images, I'm gonna put up some images so you can see the differences on VFib and VTAC as far as how they look on an ECG strip. Now, kind of coming back for a second on this SA and AV node, I wanted to make sure that we're clear on the rate that this sets because in the event that the SA node fails, or in the event that the AV node fails, we know that they each set their own rate. So for instance, somebody that's having a failure with an SA node or an issue, we know that we're gonna lose that set rate of 60 to 100, kind of our baseline. The AV node's gonna keep going, but it's going to only go at about 40 to 60 beats per minute. And we know that that's not the ideal heart rate that we want for perfusion and for function. So this is why I wanna make sure you understand those rates. Now, another thing that comes up very often, and I'm going to draw it in a different color, and it comes up in questions that I get from students and I see it on tests, is how to identify a myocardial infarct on a rhythm strip. And one of the big ways is that we see this here. This is known as an ST elevation myocardial infarct or a STEMI. When we're looking at our rhythm right here that we see, we see our P wave, we see our Q, we see our R, 
and our S and our T wave here, it's elevated, right? I should actually even, let me make this a little bit more elevated to show you kind of how it looks so we can have a clear idea. We have an elevation of our S and our T wave. This is a classic hallmark sign of a myocardial infarct. And I want to be clear, it's not the only way that we identify a myocardial infarct on an ECG, but it is certainly a classic one that comes up very often. So one of the questions that you might get will say something about, you know, what does an ST elevation indicate? You should be thinking that it's going to indicate a myocardial infarct, okay? So if you have any other questions, please let me know. I'm gonna go ahead and um, upload some images of strips so that we can see what they look like and just kind of compare it to some of my wacky drawings here, but I wanted you to have an idea. And just so you're clear, I would say that if you have any type of um, exam or test coming up about ECGs, get familiar with what these tracings look like, specifically the ones that we discussed. Okay, so let's recap a little bit. We talked about our normal ECG tracing, right? We know our P, Q, R, S, T, and U, what they represent in relation to the chambers of the heart and the activity of the heart. We talked about the conduction, the electrical conduction, how we go from SA to AV to bundle of His down to our Purkinje fibers and then back. And then our beats per minute that each of these nodes set, we discuss our common or popular dysrhythmias, like our AFib, our A flutter, SVT, VFib, VTAC, and our bundle branch blocks. So make sure you're familiar with those. Again, recognizing what they look like and what they mean, because these are definitely the more common ones that as nurses and as nursing students, we need to be familiar with, okay? And then of course our STEMI. So, as always, feel free to watch this over and over again as much as you need to until you get it. There are a lot of good ECG information out there. The best way is just to kind of practice with this information that you've already got. So look at some of these rhythms and just try to decipher, you know, where you can see these waves and the abnormalities and what that really means. And again, reaching me is very easy. You can reach me on Instagram at tootrn, T-O-O-T-R-N, or you can email me, or you can reach me on my website, uh, www.tootrn.com. And happy studying, and good luck to all of you.